Philippians chapter 4. We are to be gripped by the gospel for the sake of our joy in God and our joy with others. So we've gone through the book of Philippians under Jason's guidance and preaching along with others. We've come to see that the problem in Philippians was a certain amount of conflict and difficulty, and we come to the resolution of that as we pick up our text this morning. But to think together about the trouble with conflict, the trouble with conflict when it is irreconcilable, when someone is frankly just simply wrong. Or when it is divisive, when people are gathering up followings, when it is personal, when what is valued, loved, cherished, is being challenged or taken away. So four questions to think about as we launch our thinking. How do you handle conflict in your relationships? Now, I want to pause. I don't want this just to be heard in the context of this room. It is particular to be worked out in the context of home and family. It is to be worked out in ministry, among ministries, and even in interchurch partnerships, which is what is here. How do you respond to difficult people? How, what is your biggest difficulty in conflict? How do you handle when a treasure, money, thing, position, ministry, agenda, maybe even your identity, gets entangled in a conflict? Now, chapter 4, verse 1 belongs to what has gone before, but it is also a pen in the hinge in what is to come. And Paul brings this book to a close. He focuses on the actual people involved in the partnership that are threatening conflict. He highlights our responsibility then to help those who are struggling. He does so first by expression of our love. Relationships are to be strengthened even in conflict by expressions of love. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy, my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. And three times in a single sentence, love for people in the church at Philippi is affirmed. And love for them he calls for all to please God. In the midst of a situation where sin and self are threatening the steady forward advance of the gospel. Paul is affirming his own love even as he prepares to call names. As those that are deeply loved, they are to stand firm. The sense here of as an ordered array, like a military formation. He began the book with this call to stand firm in the Lord, and now he brings the book to a close with a repeat of that call. They are standing firm in formation with godly leaders who have set an example. They are standing firm in formation against the enemies of the cross whose lifestyle and mindset are focused on and shaped by this present world. Do not abandon the formation to hit each other with your swords and shields. Stand together knowing who the true enemies are. They are standing firm with all those heavenly citizens and like-minded servants, all who are enrolled in the book of life. Relationships are strengthened in the midst of conflict by expressing our love and then by helping people, verses 2 and 3. He writes, I entreat Yoda, Yodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Here, Paul, from a distance, 
begins to launch resolving the personal conflict that threatened the partnership. Through patient appeals, he entreats each of these two ladies to have the same mind, the same attitude, the same orientation of heart in the Lord. They are to come to the point to where they say to each other, I am your servant and I am your sacrifice. And while in a position to exercise authority, he chooses to appeal. And we know the names of these two ladies. He has singled them out as the source of conflict. This is the only time in the New Testament that Paul, in his writing, directly addresses someone in this way. Now, he'll talk about others. Sunday morning, can you imagine? Sitting in the room. Yodia and Syntyche on opposite sides of the room, of course, they're human beings. You get to this, and all of a sudden, the letter from Paul, I wonder if I wonder if Epaphroditus stumbled at this point, or Titus, whoever's reading it. But if they're going to be resolved, that will be accomplished close at hand by faithful helpers. And a curious turn of the language here. There's a person's name who means true or loyal yoke fellow, Zychicus. A person or people who are partners together with Paul are to come alongside and facilitate the conflict resolution. These ladies have long served with Paul, side by side, standing firm with him, and now that's being threatened. And so yoke fellow, someone who is in the yoke with Paul and with the ministry and with the church, come alongside these ladies. In fact, everybody help out. So what kind of characteristics are to be cultivated in the midst of conflict? Verses 4 to 7. He says, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand, so do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now here's the connective, isn't it? Yoda, um, Yoda and Syntyche, I always want to call them odious and soon touchy, they are, they are appealed, in fact, even exhorted to be at peace. And then, in the end of this paragraph, he says that the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds. Now, notice a couple of things. First, we are to cultivate our rejoicing in the Lord. We are to be a people whose joy is in the Lord. This is a command this is what we are to do as we are resolving conflict, and yet conflict also often causes us to lose our joy. We are unhappy, sad, confused, downcast. Joylessness then becomes a symptom that conflict is going on. In fact, you can almost look at this and say he is saying rejoice in the Lord. Don't rejoice in whatever it is that you're willing to go to war with someone else for. So this is not just a command to be happy, to go around with a fake smile. This is about orienting your heart's treasure, its joy, in the right thing. In fact, in the right person. So rejoice in the Lord, at least here, may not be about, you know, this, but may be all about what my heart is actually rejoicing over and therefore willing to fight for or fight against. And secondly, we are to cultivate a characteristic of reasonableness. Verse 5, before the Lord. We are to be a people who are known by our reasonables. It is easy to become hard, difficult, and unreasonable in the midst of conflict. As a result, we are unable to see the other person's view. In the midst of conflict, be known as a sweetly reasonable and approachable person. This is to be cultivated. And thirdly, our request to the Lord. We are to be a prayer for people. We are to be a joyful people. We are to be a reasonable people. And we are to be a prayer for people. Verse 6. 
Because the Lord is near and the greatness of our burdens and anxieties, we must bring our petitions to the Lord. Now here's another good verse with many wide applications, yet is often dragged kicking and screaming out of its context. When is it most important that our bathed in gratitude prayers and supplications be made to the Lord? Precisely when conflict and relational difficulty is giving rise to anxieties and worries. In the midst of conflict, when worries and anxieties rise, speak to God with your requests with a heart full of gratitude. We are to be a joyful people. We are to be a reasonable people. We are to be a prayerful people. And we are to be a trusting people, verse 7. And so we have our rest from the Lord. Now some of you have been wondering why in the world I'm connecting verses 1 to 3 and 4 to 7, and I do so because of the promise that is given here. The peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Now this word is plural. It's corporate. It's community. This is not just some kind of individualistic peace that will be, God will referee, but rather it is a perimeter of defense that God establishes among those even who are in conflict so that they will be brought to the kind of reconciliation, the kind of peace that God intends. The guard here is, is to prevent that which fuels and frames and furthers the conflict. If we are a joyful people, a reasonable people, a prayerful people, and a trusting people. But then there are some attitudes that are to be examined in verses 8 and 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me do, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So now you know why this is connected. Be at peace. The peace of God will guard and the God of peace will be with or among you. Now, we often think of this paragraph as a purity filter. We lift the text out of its context, and we don't apply it to conflict. Connection here, God of peace will be alongside of us as we think and follow in ways that are pleasing to God, even in the midst of conflict. In verse 8, the attitudes are first in what we are to think. Why does Paul choose these particular things as things to think about? I mean, there's lots to think about, right? Why these things? He chooses these because our sinful tendency in the midst of conflict is to listen to, to think about the vices that these virtues correct. Relational difficulties tend to provoke us and to tempt us into sinful thoughts. And therefore, notice the verb here, Think on these things. In other words, be on the guard against fantasizing, thinking about scenarios, self-talk about the person or around the situation. Watch replaying conversations and situations and then rewriting the script to your advantage. Watch for those thoughts that are planning what you're going to say or do or those heart orientations or those plans pleasing to God. Now, all that follows here does not exclude accurate assessment of sin or confrontation of evil thoughts and behavior, but this is primarily focused on what you are to think in the midst of conflict. Think about what is true because our tendency in conflict is to listen to and think about things that are not true. Think about what is honorable because our tendency is to listen to and think about things that are dishonorable and disrespectful of those we are in conflict with. We are in conflict with. We delight in seeing or even hearing or even putting them down ourselves. Think about what is just because our tendency is to listen to and think about the things that are not just, not right 
about the person or the situation. We tend to think in terms of vengeance and getting even. Our minds are filled with striking back plans and hopes. Think about what is pure because our tendency is to listen to and to think about things that charge the person with sin. We tend just to be sinful in our thoughts about the other person wishing evil on them. And think about what is lovely because our tendency is to listen to and to think about all the unloving, unlovely, displeasing things about the other person. We tend to focus on the warts, the bumps, the disfigurements in their character or conduct so that we distort the person in our mind. They become a caricature of who they are, not the realities. And think about what is commendable because our tendency is to listen or to think all the things that we disapprove of and are not commendable in the situation. That's what we focus on. After all, that's to our advantage to do so. In order to justify our attitudes and actions, we focus on the negatives, failures, foolishnesses, ignorance, simplicity, silliness of the person. And now two overarching categories are to guide and guard our thoughts in the midst of conflict. Think about what is excellent, meaning virtues or moral excellence. Think about what is praiseworthy, meaning values. That is, to those things that reflect the work of God in the person and thus glorify God. Think about the person's virtues and think about the person's values. So as we are working to resolve conflict, we may, may we think on the things that are true and honorable and just, pure and lovely, commendable, and therefore things that are full of value and are full of virtue. And finally, it is useful to use these as a guide and guard for our general thought life as well. After all, if you are not in the habit of thinking this way, conflict will certainly expose the fact that you are not thinking like this. After all, it is wrong to have a thought life filled with untrue, shameful, wrong, impure, ugly, contemptible, worthless, and worthy to be condemned thoughts. And attitudes that are to be examined in what we think, but also in whom we follow. Who do you strive to be like in the midst of conflict? Who are your models? Who do you seek to follow when you're struggling in marital or ministry conflict? Paul had taught and practiced all of these in many conflicts that attended his ministry. His teaching and conduct are to be learned and observed and practiced in the way that wisdom dictates. And the result as the God of peace will be with us. Paul is here highlighting the corporate and community aspect when people are pleasing to God, even in the midst of differences and debates and conflict, then the peace of God will guard our hearts and minds and the peace of God will be face-to-face -face among the believing community. Now, as we come to the close of the book, and as Paul is wrapping up this issue of conflict in the church, I think the next section is still continued. Even though he has said, finally, it's finally in relation to conflict. But I think now he is going to bring forward, possibly, the thing that has divided Yodica and Syntyche and possibly others in the church. And that is their support of Paul. And so in the midst of uh, developing our joy in conflict, so is con contentment to be developed, verses 10 through 13. When is it hardest to be contented? When is it hardest to have broken relationships? In the same situations of hardship and difficulty and this is what Paul is going to take up as he continues to address the church in this closing section. He writes in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. 
What does that mean? If he says revived, that means that it had been flagging, it had been dying, it had been diminishing, and now in some way had been stirred up and made given new life. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking and being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need, for I can do all things through him who strengthens me. And so as we're thinking about contentment, first we find their restored concern for Paul in verse 10. Great joy when people who have been struggling in a relationship now begin to really look at the other person's interests first. The church's concern for Paul has found a new life. But their lack did not come necessarily because they didn't concern, because they didn't have an opportunity. And when an opportunity presented itself, they were quick to respond. But notice its difficult challenge in verses 11 and 12, challenge to contentment. Paul is careful when he commends their giving to remind them of his difficult challenge. Remember where Paul is. He's dictating this letter in the darkness of a Roman prison or possibly from house arrest, but more likely he's in prison. He is faced with the difficult challenge of deep personal and financial hardship, yet he does not see himself as in need. Why? Well, he has learned in every situation to be content. Whether he has little or he has much, he has learned to be content. Contentment is essentially the sense of well-being that comes from being submitted to God's providence and God's provision. This can be a great challenge for us. We are often so discontent with our own situations So let's pause for a moment and think about two sentences a bit. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. So notice that Paul is not opening this subject in order to talk about his needs. His appreciation for what they have done is simply genuine thanksgiving. No other agenda is at play. He's not raising money. Why? Because Paul does not think of himself as being in need. We might say in want. He is not poverty stricken, at least not as he views himself. Now, <laughs> we would look at him and say, you've got to be kidding. Anyone in the depths of the Mamertine prison in Rome is probably in need. But he doesn't view himself that way. And how does one get to this amazing point? How do we get there? What does he say? Talk to me. He... He learned it. He learned it. Make no mistake. You do not wake up one day in the midst of plenty and the next in the midst of poverty and say, I accept it. For most of us, there is the painful learning process that takes place. This is learning by experience, by practice. You cannot become content by simply reading a good book on contentment. For example, Jeremiah Burroughs, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment. It is also learning through reflection to simply go through financial hardship without serious personal and spiritual reflection isn't learning. Maybe why we do it over and over and over again, because we are just slow learners. So what is the effect of this experience of hardship and biblical reflection that constitutes real learning? We know how to be brought low and how to abound in every, in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Just reflect on this sentence for a moment. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. Can you say that? 
about yourself? Have you learned this by personal experience or by examination, by reality and reflection? But notice it's biblical confidence in verse 13. What then is the secret that Paul has learned? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. There it is. Surprised? Didn't you expect it to be, God will provide for me in every need? Didn't you expect it to be, well, by prayer, God supplies my every need? Maybe you expected it to be, by faith, God provides my every need. That's not the secret. The secret is, you can go through anything, good, bad, rich, poor, plenty, poverty, hungry, beaten, persecuted, imprisoned, through the one who strengthens you in his providence and in his provision. It is the strength that you must learn to have, not to have what you think you need. And then as we come to the end, he deals with relationships that are to be maintained. He opens this section with a call to strengthening the relationships through expressions of love and fellowship and unity. And now he closes the book by wrapping back around in this section. Godly leaders, even in the severest of trials, must seek to maintain relationships Don't hear the following verses as some strategy or agenda that makes the words manipulative. Rather, in sustaining the partnership, there is a deep, heartfelt gratitude for what has been done in the past. Listen to what he says, verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share in my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership There it is, top and bottom of the book. Entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving, except you only. What's he saying? From the very beginning, you were the first and in the beginning, the only church to support me in my ministry. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. And so relationships are being maintained in a sustaining partnership, verses 14 to 16. Here is the sweetness of a sustaining partial. In the midst of hardship and troubles and serving the Lord, they moved to share in it. They chose to enter into the fellowship of his troubles. How did they do it? Stepping forward when no one else would and supporting Paul. It's risky. It was hard. They were identifying themselves with Paul, and yet they saw this partnership as being important enough to begin a reciprocal giving and receiving. They gave financially, he gave spiritually. And with its loving characteristics in verses 17 and 18, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. Love characterizes this relationship. Paul is not after their money. He is, not con- he is much concerned for what will be accounted to their credit. He is not looking for bonus points with him or with God. He is looking for fruit, for that harvest of righteousness that Jesus produces. He is looking for the results of his prayer in chapter 1, verses 9 to 11. Same language. Right giving always enriches the giver. It does not diminish in the least what they have done. Epaphroditus has delivered on their promise and delivered on their provision. He has not only received every penny they gave, but has filled him up. He is now well supplied. He has enough money to get by. No, 
Through their love and the sending of their pastor, he is now strengthened for the hardships he is enduring. It's not about the money. It's about the people. If they hadn't sent a dime, sending their love through Epaphroditus would have been enough. You get it? As though it's not enough, he now lifts what they have given and removes the lid. He holds it up and he waves it back and forth. And from what they have given, breathes out a sweet smell. It is the fragrance of incense of the sacrifice of Jesus. And even more, what they have given and what he has received is sweet and acceptable to God. And the relationship is maintained by a supplying promise, verse 19. NLT renders this this way. This same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which has been given to us in Christ Jesus. Having emptied themselves, they now will be filled with a supplying promise. Having been well provided for by their gift, God will now well provide for them out of his riches. They have sown a seed of righteousness that will return in its harvest. God will take care of them. It will be measured by the in glory riches of Jesus Christ. If this promise is taken out of its context, then God simply has not kept it to Paul, nor to the Thessalonican church, nor to the people at Philippi. There are many imprisoned today and impoverished. Christians who believe this promise and still are material and want. So, how can this be true? First, this promise is not merely material, It may be primarily spiritual. It may well be that God may abundantly supply all we need in strength in order to bear up in the dire and dreadful circumstance. My God will supply all your need. Parentheses of the strength that he has learned. (laughs) Right? God's promise often has an in-glory element. We do not get all the promise of the promises here and now. True faith believes in the promise but bows to the providence of God to supply how and what and most importantly, when he sees fit. God's in-glory riches are the source, the standard for what God will supply to his people in their need. And... This is for an exalting praise. Verse 20. On all this, as in all things, we live for exalting God, for his praise and his glory. This is not just a Christian slogan. This is the reality two Christians aim for and hope in, that we will boast in God alone. Rejoice in the Lord, he has said four times in this book. Rejoice in the Lord because we tend to rejoice in all different kinds of things. And now he wraps it all around. That rejoicing in the Lord will result in our giving glory and praising God forever and ever. And then as he closes the book, he gives his closing greetings in verse 21. Through 23, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The letter closes. It say hello to the believers, as we would say it. Say hello to the saints. Funny how we don't speak like this. We use other language directly from the Bible. Why not this? Do you know with the possible exception of in James that Christians are only called saints? Yet people who are now saints used to be sinners. It's not my identity. I am and you are a saint. You may be a saint that sins, but your identity is not as a sinner. Saints are not a special class of elevated and formally recognized Christians. Rather, all Christians are set-apart ones or saints. And all that he has written is based on who they are and what God gives. They are saints. They are the sanctified ones, the set-apart ones, the holy ones. To do what they are becoming requires the grace of God, for human effort alone cannot produce God's true works. 
But the effort of the saints through the gracious power of God does produce God's true work. So as we wrap this up quickly in closing, resolving conflict God's way means confronting the principles and helping people and developing a conflict-resolving character, thinking the right way and following the example of right people. The result, peace between people, the peace of God in us, and the God of peace among us. And contentment and caring as it relates to this, where are you? Is your soul calm and quiet before the Lord, bowing to his providence and accepting his provision even in the midst of hardships? And even in deep personal, financial, spiritual difficulty, will you love people so much that you will give to meet their needs? And may we echo with Paul. At the moment, I have all I need. And more, for I am generously supplied with what God has provided through others. These gifts are a sweet-smelling sacrifice that is acceptable and pleasing to God. And this is the very same God who takes care of me, will supply all your need from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Now, all glory to God our Father, forever and ever. Amen. May we be at peace. May the God of peace be with us. May the peace of God dwell in us. And we may we be at peace, content, settled, even in the midst of hardships. For God has given us his grace, his strength, as all we need in those moments. Father, so bless your word to our hearts this morning. And Father, in these two major topics that are connected, connected in our lives, in our hearts, in our ministries, Father, I pray that you would cause us to be the kind of people you are making us to become. That we will conduct ourselves in a way that breathes pleasing to you and holds forth to the world glorious light of the gospel, of the reconciliation to God. May your name be pleased and glorified and honored. For it's in Jesus' name we pray.